Hello and welcome to the Mountain Gazette Library. I'm John Buzar, and this week we proudly present the writings of Barry Corbett, pioneer climber, extreme skier, filmmaker, editor, and writer. Enjoy. Enjoy the great American West. What's left of it? October on top of Half Dome. The whole Sierra was blanketed with a foot of snow. On it. I had just entered a pleasantly empty subway car. And the next thing you know, you're in this calm, calm water. When you know who you are, when you get in touch with yourself, you don't have choices. So I think as a journalist right now, you have a lot of opportunity to really put across quality work that will stand out in a sea of a lot of garbage. If I've learned anything about life balance, it would be that the no balance balance is where it's at. <laughs> Episode 4, Hallucinations by Barry Corbett from Mountain Gazette 33. I have a friend who saved for long years to buy a sailboat. He discovered that there was no place to go. That was a colossal disappointment, he said. Last May, I had accumulated enough time to go somewhere for three weeks. I had no sailboat, so I pondered where to go. To my colossal disappointment, I could find no place to go. In front of me is an executive planner. It has a few entries because I normally am so overwhelmed by executing that I have no energy for planning. A notation for Saturday, May 25th, says, Go to cabin? I suppose that some crazy evening, I must have actually decided to spend three weeks by myself in a one-room cabin, in a headlong retreat from the phone, liquor, electricity, running water, and relationships. All the scary things in my life. I looked forward to this trip as I energetically met film deadlines overreacted and in general indulged in a manic speed trip no matter i knew i was soon to be going to no place at all with nothing to do the rules take two serious books for edification and reflection but not for entertainment no dope pets or people no music making writing painting photography or other habit forming activity go somewhere and live with yourself I cheated. I took three liters of red wine, one for each week. I took my executive planner, in which I sometimes wrote a maximum of two column inches a day. The books I took were The Lazy Man's Guide to Enlightenment and Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism. I would prefer not to tell you that, but I have no choice. I cheated further by taking a field guide to Rocky Mountain Wildflowers. I feel that I should tell you why I made this decision to disappear for a while. I felt prosed by professional and domestic conflicts and wanted to suspend them for long enough to see if either my problems or my sense of being victimized by them would go away. I also lusted after sensible alternatives. The following is from my planner. Day one, cabin. A stupefying hangover prevails because friends had dropped in on the end of my departure to celebrate my foolishness. Everything happened last night. Nothing happening today. I'm content since I know how good things are going to get. I worry about the overlay of Eastern mystique that hangs around things like this. I think there's both a mystery and a message in my solo, but it's all so damn trippy that it seems sort of precious. Mystery, message, mystique. I wrote the account of my 22 days at the cabin just recently, three months after the fact, to put the experience into more wordly context. I've added another 22 days to the mix. There was no attempt at consecutive ordering made here. These are just some of my days without the mystique. Day one, world. A client finds out his contract doesn't include something big that he's already promised to his management. How could he be so naive? Am I the keeper of my brother's illusions? I am. 
I speed to the downtown office, attempt to reconcile my various prose styles, research all the ingredients carefully, and write a letter that refuses to choose between alternatives. It scathes and consoles. It's an onslaught of goodwill, right thought, venom, and threat. They'll love it, because I'm in the right. So are they, but that's the problem. Day 2. Cabin. Evidently, nothing happens again. There is no entry in my executive planner. Day 2. World. Yesterday's problem client calls to express his good feelings, and I wish I hadn't written. But he frees me to do what I do, which is edit film. But this film appalls. All our films are misleading in one way or another, but this one is an $18,000 raunch. Funded by Midwestern Bank, its warped objective is to depict the good life as perceived by the bank's loan officers. It's the good life for the teeming blacks and Polacks because of all the socially redeeming industry that exists to employ them into grateful consumers. It's good for industry because of all the toilet trained labor that consumerism makes available. Highly semi-skilled hype. Good for the bank because of loans to labor and industry alike. How beautiful is this garden? Day three, cabin, Memorial Day, visitors, a young couple on horses, a strident voice from a concealed man in a wheelchair, me. Would you mind going back the way you came? Private property? Yep. They wheel their horses in acknowledgement of private property rights. Aghast at myself and then at them, I return to the vigil. Repression. More visitors, two men and a daughter approach on horses. A voice from the woods once again requests withdrawal. This time, an adult in very full chaps detaches himself and lopes voiceward to parlay. Intimidation, big horses, small wheelchair. You own this place? Yep. I live in Paradise Hills. Great. You can ride from here all the way to Central City. Mmm. You alone here? Why do you want to be alone? Uh, religious reasons. Holy, holy. What's your religion? How the hell should I know? I declined to answer. There's no, no trespassing sign up here. He's right. I know I'm sorry to do this to you, but I really need to be alone. I'm sorry you feel that way. So am I. He leaves without sensing that I admire his good balance in the face of hardship. He pauses to explain the unexpected turn of events to friend and daughter, then moves off towards the end of the trail. It's still day three, a long day, more visitors. This time, two four-wheel drive pickups clatter importantly toward me. I am mind blown, outraged, undone, for the enemy is here. A redneck father and a semi-long-haired teenage son occupy the first cab, and I'm out of words. I really don't like people driving over this land. I just don't like it. How'd you get here? I drove. Well, I've been trying for three years to find a way from here down into Clear Lake, and I thought this might be the way, he says. Like some Noveo Vasco da Gama. It's not. US 6 goes there. Listen, I'm willing to talk to anybody, mister, but I want him to meet me halfway. I mean, I want him to be friendly. He says this defensively, eyeing his young son as if he's looking in a mirror. Look. I'm really sorry that I'm not being friendly, true becoming false, but I just don't want trucks down here. Listen, we didn't hurt your goddamn road at all, not one goddamn bit, he says in triumph and backs up into the confer with his friends. They talk for a long, long time and decides no rifles and leaves. What should I learn from these encounters? Who was worse? Is it wrong to want to be alone? 
Is it wrong to hatefully and unjustly assume that all people in four-wheel drive pickups are mobile insults? I take a felt pen, a shingle, and a two-by-two, two, and I make a sign that says, Please, private property. No horses, jeeps, etc. No through road ahead or path. No bull. No offense. Thanks. I drive the cattle guard and plant the sign. I guess it's significant that I have no more gate crashers during the remainder of the three weeks. Holy, holy. I have time to decide on this long day. There are only two kinds of films. Films to persuade, films to open. Day three, world. I apply my trade converting footage into film. This film I struggle with is persuasive if you don't see the relationship involved or naive if you do. I derive perverse pleasure, an opening experience of sorts, by cutting the chrome and glass and steel of modern buildings to box. The cutting of visuals can reflect the tempo and mood, and even the intent, of the composer so accurately that Bach seems to exalt what man had brought in downtown Milwaukee. Alchemy. Day 4. Cabin. All out war on overlapping thought patterns in an effort to be alone, to be nowhere. It's discouraging to find that the mind matters incessantly, as if it had an audience. For some time, I sat with flowering dandelions and considered this thing as I sat. I feel some love. Although it may not be an affinity for dandelions, I call it technical success, and take the money and run. Exploitation, beauty, peace, and awareness have no real collateral. Day four, world. Trade applying vaguely pleasant. I put off my partner who's returning from New York tonight and who might want to stop for a drink. Why does that make me feel guilty? Wanting to be alone is tantamount to being unfriendly. And, for that matter, I don't even know why I want to be alone tonight. To write this? To be free not to cope? The fear of an invasion of privacy is the fear of being discovered. I hide. The only thing worse than being discovered is being discovered hiding. The risks compound. On gaffer tape. Gaffer tape is wide, gray, sticky substance used to pack and secure film equipment. It resembles duct tape, but is much stickier. Gaffer tape is exceedingly sticky. You can attach anything to anything with gaffer tape. It's always, it always stays stuck. Very sticky stuff. Insatiably glommy and very comforting product. For it sticks your stuff together. Now, as you become older and wiser, you watch the personal drama unfold with less and less cohesion. You lose what you had, you gain what you don't need, and you require more energy to remain in place. You acquire so much information and concomitant, concomitant, concomitant interpretive baggage information and interpretive baggage and opinions and openness to new opinions that nothing can be guaranteed to be right. Absolutes fall away like flies. The reality depends upon the perceiver and nothing can be believed with confidence. This is a definite problem for beings. The answer is gaffer tape. Gaffer tape enables you to enlist all the fine properties of stickiness in your own favor. Just take all the fractured elements and stick them together in any order. Doing that creates a cohesive entity that can be identified and therefore related to in safety. Maybe that's how we stick it to ourselves. We try to keep it all together. There should be some way to neutralize the use of gaffer tape, or at least keep it judicious. Flypaper is useful for catching flies, but you want to be able to step out if you fall in yourself. The only clue I have for this dilemma, and I find the idea troublesome, is that time is quite a lot like gaffer tape. Day five world. 
My enthusiasm for this piece has waned, and I've taken a week off from my book of days. Why publish this drivel? That's Mountain Gazette's problem. Given a publisher, one publishes, who's at fault? Day 6, Cabin. Milarepa, a 10th century Tibetan yogi, encountered demons that had bodies big as thumbs and heads like plates. Demons to Milarepa were manifestations of his own negative energies. My demons are also as big as a thumb and they manifest as bumblebees. They cruise in and out in an amiable stupidity, battering from surface to surface like bumper cars, and I struggle with my noisy demons. I feel possessed. With nothing to do, I try really and truly to do nothing. I can't. I'm trying to stop trying. I need a gap. Day 6, World. Five separate films and their sponsors nag me with disruptive detail. This wall of trivia needs to be dispersed before craft can proceed. If the mind is spared conflicting commands for a while, it can relax and sense the overlapping qualities and similarities of the diverse material. Then the elements of a film magically determine their own structure by being allowed to. Once the material makes its proper arrangements known to him, the editor is just a functionary who can splice. That's phase one. Phase two is manipulative. After structured integrity is allowed to develop, then insidious intent runs wild and the editor can change, threaten, stroke, alienate, seduce, or coerce without either jeopardizing or enhancing the film's structure. The film's sound structure. Structure is the hardest because it can depend upon tempo, mood, texture, story, shock, thesis, antithesis, or anything, or nothing, or all of these things. It has to reflect what's there. It requires discovery. Interpretation is the most fun because you can use techniques like putting English on your serve. Workability is a mixed bag in which you jiggle the objective, prejudice, persistence, and clout of the various forces involved in the film. The biggest force is usually the guy paying the bill. Then you stick all of those stop frames together, 24 to the second, and you watch the photons of your ego bursting all over the silver screen until they bounce back, repulsed, seeping like spilled milk onto the shag rug of the screening room. Such wretched excess. Day 7, Cabin. The dread natterer is perceived as an enzyme of insanity, physical and mental defection. Eyes hurt and closely washed breathing scours the underbelly of my brain. I'm caught up with this nonsense and can't relax with it. This is the first time I've been worried. Claustrophobia. It's too deep to breathe in. Wine day. Wine is nice. The fight of the self-vindicator. Wine is nice. And being newly unaccustomed, it makes me want to try things I wouldn't always do, such as dive naked into anthills. It makes me euphoric and communicative, loving. It allows examination of concepts or non-concepts unavailable to me when I'm deep-throating the Dharma, it gives me time. Day 7, World. I took Willie unsold back to the airport this morning, and I'm left in contemplative shock. It's bizarre, after not seeing him for four years, to find how very much our lives are common ground. Just one person acting out two fantasies. It's been years since I've felt like discussing my magnificent and crummy past with anyone. But Willie's past is mine, and mine is his, and talking about it is like one ego getting off on the antics of its various aspects. We use each other as a mirror, blackboard, stimulant, and antidote. It's scary to think to myself, if I have this relationship latent or developed, recognized or not, with untold numbers of people. Hideous. Our carcass 
is in a sling. Let us go then, you and I, for we have no choice. Day eight, cabin, still driving wedges into my brain. Painful, powerful, and scary. I chastise another bumblebee. A cat? I see an enormous Siamese. Or a puny puma. Silky and beautiful, gliding between trees. Day 8, world. Nothing much happened today, which is a relief. Day 9, cabin. Try to be as simple as you can, I tell my planner. Minimum impact. Day 9, world. Attending to busyness and nothing gets done. I am irritated by the dedication required to maintain my speed and by the uselessness of speed maintained. Day 10, cabin. At 4 p.m., I am stalked by cat. While sitting absorbed in other things, I have peripheral flash that tells me cat is crouched six feet away and working closer. I think of Castaneda and his friendly coyote. I think of madness and its messengers. For lack of communication, I think of conversation. Hello, pussy. Pussy bounds down the slope. I came to get empty, i.e. to become a suitable terminal for communication, and I can't even hold my tongue in front of the most quiet of animals. I have a sense of aggression and speed refusing to slow down, or of hope and fear refusing to strike a bargain. The cat is out of the bag and the fix is on. We are separate. Day 10, world. If alienation stopped being bad, would sunset stop being good? Without expectation, can alienation exist? Without alienation, can dualism exist? Without dualism, can sunsets exist? Hello, pussy. Day 11, cabin. It's a quieter, better day. I'm doing nothing in a more business-like fashion. Accepting it as hard work does nothing need to be done. Instead of harboring anticipations of the beneficial results of doing nothing. Nothing times nothing is nothing and yields nothing. Except that the Natterer editorializations. Simplicity is no longer a consideration. Business as usual. Day 11. World. Solar. Extravaganza. Red skies. Red earth. Alpen glow lights and power line and Mother Cabrini's shrine. Would sunset stop being good? Enigma pie. Day 12, cabin, depressed. Technique and dedication have failed utterly. One cannot be dedicated to nothing. Each thought pattern has its friends and relations. Wine, bad wine, for a while. I sit outside with bottle and glass on a stump, trying to feel the dignity of the occasion, but it's just bad wine. I go inside in time to witness a tableau. A teenage couple is passing by the cabin. The boy prances and makes insistent animal sounds. The girl, unamused, repeatedly screams, Don't! The charade is real, though they seem physically apart. Don't, don't, she cries, pleasantly terrified. The boy sees me leering from the window, waves with a high good humor as if we share a conspiracy and continues the ritual. Don'ts echo from the forest as the couple proceeds. I turn to serious matters. Why, I thought, am I drinking lousy wine alone, trying to do nothing, and indulging in voyeurism? These were my reasons. One, I want to create or experience a gap in the constant rush of thought and emotions with which I fill my days. Sub-reasons. A. To let intuition get an anti-thought in edgewise. To develop a sense of space which in turn is, I'm told, characterized by enhanced awareness and comparison for self and others, especially like cutting through notion of making friends with oneself. Point two. I also want to reconcile form or phenomena with undifferentiated space. This subject is 
appallingly vast, unless I'm told you understand it. I don't. Why do I call it a subject if the object is to transcend the subject object? I know nothing. I can't do nothing. Can't even experience nothing when I die. I'll be a beginner at that too. Where should I start? Day 12 world. Counterpoint. Empty times playing against the sting of being alive. I convince myself that this thought is creative, not morbid. Day 13. I have a moral hangover from last night's excesses. Speculation is not my strong suit, and I really feel like I'm getting too serious about all this. I wheel to the spring, scoop a hole in the mud, and wait for the little pool to clear. And Robin bathes first, and then it's my turn for cleansing. It rains. Everything feels good. Ask and good things are going to happen. Day 13. World. A nice piece of relationship, huh? Nice piece of relationship takes place today, and I feel cheerfully unethical. I'm alone tonight for the first time in a week, and I have a rush of expectation and having no expectations. Day 14, cabin. Okay, period. Day 14, world. Launched with a client, he was pleased with the commercials I'd made for him and confirmed his euphoria with gin. Afterward, the color and whereabouts of his rental car had slipped his mind. I repeated directions to the airport and left him carless, for I am not my client's keeper. Day 15, cabin. Snow all day long on June 8th. A beautiful, nice day. Neurological buzz. It's easier to do nothing when it's so busy outside. If phenomenal flux were more constantly apparent, perhaps emotions would subside. In a snowstorm, it's hard to know which snowflake to focus on. Day 15, world. Last night's emotional encounter caused today's hangover, didn't it? My goodness, I've been in the overindulgence business for 18 years not knowing that I could do myself such a disservice. Day 16, cabin. Wind and sun, painful sunburn, I love it. Day 16, world, Halloween. I masked off the screen on my editing table with gaffer tape to simulate a widescreen. I masked my feelings about Michigan spectator sports with devilishly clever cutting and about a client who hasn't paid with hypocrisy. Children I know and love well arrived in monster masks, clearly showing their true natures. Their chaperones arrived straight, unmasked, seemed to be in relative drag. Who is that masked man? Day 17, cabin. My eyes still hurt as if I were breathing through them. If one seeks to prevent pain with each breath, one is busy as hell. The understanding improves, but the condition prevails last wine day. This wine is truly pig shit. As always, it triggers considerations, this time about my psychological set. The set is derived from the books I am reading and from the deep dissatisfaction that seems too close to the surface. As I am trying to learn to see it, here's the scam. We are alienated from ourselves, i.e. rendered neurotic. By Taoism, a mode of perception and intellectual thought that characterizes ego. Neither dualism nor ego exist as things, but like a politician's media campaign, once they're postulated, their notions serve to influence and confuse. Ego perpetuates the dualist mode. Dualism serves ego, a circle jerk. At another level, dualism is the description of phenomena, space, and whatever else exists as either subject or object. Since this arbitrary separation helps ego see itself as discrete from whatever is not included in its own definition of self, ego and the dualism made me become unbearable. Dualism is conflict. The struggle is the struggle. All we have to do, obviously, is to quit. Is that all? 
some very bad wine and one plagiarizes shamelessly. The people from whom I plagiarize probably don't care. Day 17, World. I resigned from the American Alpine Club today. Day 18, Cabin. A good day. A good super, why is this evening so bottom line bad? No one is here, nothing is wrong, and my bummer is demonic and complete. I didn't know I could do that all by myself. I've read a Tibetan parable of a monkey locked in a house of his own creation. He experiences various states of despair and elation as he tries to escape his condition, but nothing really works. He's still imprisoned by his hallucinations. The solution, the tale goes, is to recognize and laugh at the hallucinations. I take comfort in the notion of laughing my way through the hallucinations, but comfort is undoubtedly a cruel hoax. Still, the idea appeals. Day 18, World. I had an easy and disappointing day today. I showed our client in Michigan his new film depicting the pathetic emptiness, yeah, vicariousness of tourist activities of tourist activities in his state. He was pleased by the accuracy of our statement. Sure, that Michigan flagging tourism industry would be forever revitalized. I was pleased that his ugly duckling of a film had won his approval. My related despondency stems from the idea that we pool our mediocrity. My client and me were proud to share the total pointlessness of what we say and do because we know that nobody will object. We're just playing the game, and you can tell the best players by their colorful uniforms. The world laughs at you. Day 19, Cabin. Uppers and downers, it's hard to laugh at the hallucinations. Laugh and the world laughs at you. Today's hallucination is frustration. Vibrating intimately with frustration is frustrating. Who could laugh except a frustrated cynic? I yearn tragically for more convenient hallucination. Perhaps I'll be a fireman when I grow up. Day 19, World. I had an easy and disappointing day. I showed our client in Alberta his new film depicting the utter tragedy of marketing his beautiful province to the global lech for uncluttered real estate. He loved it, so we found ourselves in agreement. We both get paid for what we do. The reason the monkey is supposed to laugh his way through the hallucinations is that they're his own creations. Why would I make such a mess? How could I be so creative? Day 20, cabin, nothing, period. Day 20, world. My dog cries outside the shed where I write. She doesn't like to be alone. She has a dream house of her own, and I'm it. Day 21, cabin, pretty boring day. I'm sure getting ready to leave this place. Day 21, World. Just finished Tales of Power. Castaneda makes me laugh and cry more than any other author. At the end, it's all warm tears. We're all alone, Carlitos. Don Genero said softly, that's our condition. Castaneda makes me think longingly of sitting alone on a desert peak, waiting patiently to see the lines of the earth. Day 22, Cabin. Day 22, cabin. What the hell is this? I arrived on a Saturday, left three Saturdays later, and it's one day more than three weeks. I've been cheated, detained by order of the hallucinator general, who can't even count. In fact, this whole excursion seems like a dream, a hallucination of insight into insightlessness. There has been isolated instances of apparent timelessness, but these two are gone, safely gaffer taped into continuity. Day 22, World. I can't say that any one series of days was better, harder, spacier, or more instructive than the other. I'm not sure that one even influenced the other. They're just days without any psychological or moral balance. While I vividly remember occasional yearnings for convenience and companionship while I was gone, 
I now find myself subject to periodic urges to disappear again. I'm glad I went away, and I know I'll do it again. I have no idea where I'll go next time, or what I'll set out to accomplish. If I'm lucky, of course, there will be no place to go and nothing to do. I'm looking forward to it immensely. The Mountain Gazette Library is produced and hosted by me, John Boostar. For more, head over to mountaingazette.com slash subscribe today and pick up a subscription to the magazine. This podcast is executive produced by Mike Rogge, marketing by Austin Holt, produced by Connor Sedmak, social media by Amy Doran, and public relations by Ryan Rowe. No part of this podcast may be reproduced without written permission from Mountain Gazette and its parent company, Verb Cabin, LLC.